Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. The world is a complex place. The news comes at us at hyperspeed 24-7. All the while, we have to deal with family, work, and life. Therefore, more than ever, it's critical that there are those among us, journalists mostly, whose job it is to distill and explain events to us. Not to tell us how or what to think, but to present the big stories in depth and in a narrative way that allows us to be smarter about the world and refine how we live in it. If you do this better than my guest, James B. Stewart, he's been doing it for many years, first as a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the Wall Street Journal, currently as a New York Times columnist and staff writer for The New Yorker, and in best-selling books like Den of Thieves, Disney War, and Bloodsport. Now he takes us deep into the investigations and the stories that have been consuming us for the past three years in his new book, Deep State, Trump, the FBI, and the Rule of Law. It is my pleasure to welcome James B. Stewart back to this program. James, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate those words. Well, it's a delight to have you here, and you have been doing this for uh, quite a while. And and one of the things that's quite remarkable in that that I was struck by is that there are certain characters in this story in Deep State, Hillary Clinton and, and, and Rudy Giuliani, I guess most notably, that have been recurring characters over the years in many of the things that you've looked at. Talk about that. Yeah, that's that's true. I, I guess um, the Giuliani goes back to one of my earliest books, The Prosecutors, which he didn't like the portrait of him in there, but I, I think it's been amply borne out by subsequent events. And he shows up in my book, Den of Thieves, and now he's in the pages of Deep State. Hillary Clinton was you know, a major subject of my book, blood sport. She didn't like that either. She didn't, <laughs> hasn't really spoken to me since, but she, of course, again, is a character in deep state. And then I think less known is I've known Donald Trump for decades. I covered him years ago um, when I was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I think people have forgotten that he had a very brief career as a so-called corporate raider. He was making, he bought the, uh, you know, the shuttle airplane to Washington, and then he was going to make a run, I think, at another airline company. And so I interviewed him back then and had various interactions with him. And now, of course, he's one of the major characters in Deep State, not to mention President of the United States. I want to talk a little bit about Trump and the way he sucks people in to to his world. A former political operative wrote a book entitled Everything That Trump Touches Dies. In many ways, (laughs) there's this way that he draws people in, and you see it with so many of the characters in Deep State. Mm-hmm. You see them wrestling with his tactics. I think in many cases, people have never really confronted someone quite like him. But you see, you see the way he operates. I mean, first of all, he now has enormous power. And it's, it never um, ceases to amaze me, the allure that that is for some people, how they'll set aside whatever scruples they have in what sometimes turns out to be the misguided belief that, oh, they will influence him for the better, or they'll change him somehow, or they'll make him more presidential. But then on the micro level, he gets in these meetings, and he'll state something as fact that is, you know, blatantly untrue, and then, you know, lean into the person and either force them to contradict him or to quietly acquiesce in what they know is not the true state of affairs. And you see them wrestling with this over and over. A a, a central character is Rod Rosenstein, who was the deputy attorney general who became, he was overseeing the Russia investigation once session, recused himself. He comes in, he was a respected, independent, you know, long-serving U.S. attorney. And he slowly but surely gets kind of sucked into this um, orbit around Trump. He's horrified initially that Trump wants him to lie. Trump, Trump wants him to make it sound like it was his idea to fire Comey. He wants him to give a press conference to that effect. To his credit, Rosenstein refuses to do that, but then he nearly, he nearly loses. He melts down, has this sort of crisis over the next few days, but he ends up being a survivor in Trump world. And then he's mutely standing by while Barr just, you know, brazenly mischaracterizes the Mueller report. You see, in the end, Trump gets him where he wants him. He's got leverage over him, and that's what Trump really aims to do with most people. And uh, so you you do see, and then other people do stand up to him. McCabe stands up to him. Comey stands up to him, and you see what happens to them. They're now branded. They're not just fired. 
they're being hounded. They're being investigated criminally. He's calling them traitors. He's implying they deserve the death penalty because all they really did was discharge their duty uh, to uphold the Constitution and serve the people of the United States. And it really is about character in so many ways as you look at all the, the players in this story. And in many ways, Comey on one hand and Rosenstein on the other really represent the two extremes, one that is sucked into to that leverage, into that world of power and sucked in by Trump and Comey, who is so resistant. Right. Um, there's no question about it. I mean, one of the things I find fascinating as a writer is when you take you know, regular human beings, and you thrust them into extraordinary circumstances that they could never have anticipated or planned for. And I often think about, you know, college courses or ethics courses. And it's, it's you know, you study these things, and with hindsight, it seems easy to say what's the right thing to do. But when you're thrust into something like this in real time, you're, fa- you know, somebody is faced with very, very difficult moral, ethical, intellectual choices, and you see them behave. Sometimes, you know, the best of human nature comes out, and sometimes it's the worst. Um, but it's, a, t- to me, it's always a fascinating glimpse because, in the end, you know, history, politics, and history, they are made by human beings and the decisions and the choices that people make. And what I've tried to do in Deep State is show that in very dramatic context so that people understand how we've gotten where we are. Of course, there's that great quote from Maya Angelou, you know, when people show you who they are, believe them. <laughs> That's true. I, you know, we, we live in a, such a partisan world now that people seem to, like, cherry pick the facts that they want that support their narrative, and they, um, you know, they... They turn people into into caricatures, but that's not what the real world is is really like. And I've tried to you know get behind all of that, show these people in all their three dimensions, warts and all, strong qualities, weaknesses, including Donald Trump himself. Talk a little bit about Rosenstein because he's such a key player in all of this. And as you were talking about a few moments ago, how he gets sucked into this and panics at a certain point, and and at one point almost wants to talk to Jim Comey as the only person he felt he could talk to. Why didn't he pick up the phone and call him? Well, that's an extraordinary scene because, you know, as as many listeners will know, um, after Trump had decided to fire Comey, he called Rosenstein in to the White House, asked him what he thought, and, you know, Rosenstein made some comments about, oh, I think Comey didn't handle the Clinton administration correctly and Trump leaps on that so he'll write me a memo and so he does he brings it back the next day and then Trump goes out and says oh this is the reason I've had to fire Comey the Justice Department wanted me to do it Rosenstein wrote this memo I had no choice he wanted Rosenstein to do a press conference and say it was all his idea well this is blatantly not true I mean we now know that Trump had already decided to fire Comey and he was doing it largely because of the Russia investigation. And I think Rosenstein was un- completely unnerved by this. It, he was unprepared. He was new. He'd never encountered something like this. And he, at that juncture, is ex- talking about wearing a wire and collecting evidence on on Trump or using the 25th Amendment to get him out of office. Then slowly but surely, you see him brought under Trump's thumb one way or another. And, you know, there were two occasions when the Justice Department was drafting the press release that Rosenstein was being fired, and yet somehow emerges with his job intact. You know, what did he have to promise Trump to hold on to his job? Now, I didn't get to talk to Rosenstein, but people close to him said, well, give him credit. He hung in there. He protected Mueller. He didn't let Trump fire Mueller. He got Mueller over the finish line. But in the end, you know, who won here? I mean, Mueller pulled his punches. Rosenstein and Barr quickly grabbed that report and said it totally exonerated uh, Trump, and it most certainly did not. And, you know, Trump declared total victory. So I, I'm not sure that the, um, the fact that he somehow got him over the finish line, that the price was worth paying for that. Why do you think people were so confused by what was seen by many as the complexity of the Russia investigation and what Mueller, the investigation that Mueller was conducting. We hear now people talking about the simplicity of of the whole Ukraine issue and a quid pro quo, and, and yet people talked about not being able to really follow a simple narrative arc with respect to the Russia investigation, but but you really do capture that in Deep State. 
Well, I hope so. I, I mean, I don't know that I would call it simple, but it's certainly uh, clear. It's clear and it's comprehensible. And I think part of the problem, you know, which you alluded to earlier, is that we consume information as the media learn it. You know, it's it's not in chronological order. It's it's in the order in which little bits and pieces are discovered. So it, I sometimes liken it to like the way Jackson Pollock would take paint and just throw it on the canvas. We get this scattershot uh, disclosure of information, and it's not in any kind of coherent order. So it seems very confusing. And at some point, people say, oh, I can't, I can't follow this. I've heard some. And it's understandable they can't follow it. Who could follow it? But by going back, untangling all this, Showing it in chronological order, what I hope I can do, if nothing else, is you see the cause and effect. This happens, and something happens because of that, and something happens because of that. And it's not hard to understand. I honestly don't understand why Barr now is out, you know, going around the world trying to reinvestigate the opening of the Russian investigation, why we have a U.S., you know, an independent um, former U.S. attorney investigating it, spending, you know, God knows how much of a tax mayor's money on something that really is very clear. I, I don't think there's anything all that mysterious about it. There's nothing certainly sinister about it. You know, it all started with an Australian diplomat, uh, Australia being a very close ally and traditional intelligence partner in the U.S., and it unfolds from there, not in a way that was hostile to Donald Trump, but was confronted with extraordinary allegations that cried out to be investigated and fortunately were. And investigated by people who care deeply about their jobs and about the country. And that really goes to the heart of, of what you talk about is what the deep state really represents, not what Donald Trump says it is. Well, Donald Trump has demonized the concept of the deep state. But if, if, if what, you're ta- what he's talking about, and it is what he's talking about, is the professional bureaucracy of the federal government, I mean, and particularly those in the FBI and the Justice Department, these are people who are sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States and who work for the people of the United States and are paid by the taxpayers. They don't work for the White House. And it is their professional obligation to take serious allegations, to investigate them, and to follow the facts wherever they lead. You know, they, they're not doing this job because they want to make a lot of money. You know, the salaries are not that great, but they take pride in their work. They were used to being esteemed in their communities, and they are true patriots. They feel they are upholding the Constitution, and they are. They are a bulwark of democracy. And suddenly, they're under attack. They're being investigated. All, look, all the characters in here, Comey, McCabe, even Mueller himself, they're under criminal investigation or have been at the direction of this White House and the newly politicized Justice Department. Trump is not content to even call them the deep state. He's calling them traitors. He's implied they deserve the death penalty. He's saying now the whistleblower, the people who told the whistleblower, they're somehow traitors to the United States. The reason we have whistleblowers now is because whistleblowers have have protection under our legal system. It's, you know, people are afraid to come forward. If they don't have whistleblower status, they're afraid they'll be persecuted. This is not a healthy situation for democracy. And what's at stake is the rule of law and the independence of our democratic institutions. Talk a little bit about McCabe and how he turned out in all of this, because he did make mistakes along the way for which he has been unjustly accused much more severely than those mistakes would warrant. Well, he really made one mistake. I think, you know, McCabe was thrust in. Comey's abruptly fired. No one was more shocked than McCabe himself. Suddenly McCabe is, uh, he was the deputy director. He becomes the acting head of the FBI at one of the most perilous times in its history when it looks like Trump was on a campaign to shut down the legitimate Russia investigation. So he's thrust into this extraordinary high pressure circumstance. The very same day Comey is fired, the inspector general is asking him about this leak in a Wall Street Journal article, which, by the way, nobody today would even remember or care about, and caught up in all this other stuff out of memory slip, negligence, why, I, you know, I don't know. He misstated his role. He did authorize that leak. He was entitled to do it, by the way. There was nothing to stop him, but um, it was criticized by Comey. I don't think he wanted to... Uh, fall out of favor with Comey. Anyway, for whatever reason, he gave false testimony in that. 
And that was the one kind of slip. But he then, he later corrected Mm -hmm. that testimony. He corrected the record. It is such a footnote to history, if it even that. And the idea that he would be, he, he ends up getting demoted. He ends up getting fired in the most vindictive way imaginable in order to deprive him of his pension. He's now hanging under, he's been hanging under the threat of criminal prosecution now ever since he was fired, which is now stretching on to more than a year. His life has been upended. And all because of this little slip, I, I mean, there it would be really outrageous to pursue criminal charges against someone who corrected the record. I mean, this happens to the FBI all the time. People either lie consciously or they make a mistake or they're whatever, or they think better about it, they come back the next day, they correct it. I cannot recall an instance of that where there has ever been a criminal prosecution. And and the assumption is, based on what, what has come out so far, that even the government couldn't get a grand jury to, to bring down an indictment against him. Well, that is... a appearing more and more to be the case because the grand jury that was hearing his case or, uh, was was their term was about to expire. There were flurry of news reports that he was about to be indicted and then silence, nothing happened. So the speculation is that the grand jury declined to uh, bring an indictment, which is, by the way, very unusual. Grand juries typically do what prosecutors asked them to do. Now, supposedly, they've got another grand jury hearing evidence on him. They're still trying to get a criminal charge against him. It's it's very worrisome to me that you have people who are doing their jobs in a way that defies the president now being hounded, being persecuted, being held up as an example. I mean, how are other people in the FBI and the Justice Department supposed to interpret this? I mean, I can tell you, because I know firsthand, there are a lot of demoralized people in there. And now I'm reading today, of course, the State Department, everyone is demoralized. Who's going to want to go work for there? I mean, we, we have a long tradition of upstanding, entirely intelligent people who make a lot more money somewhere else coming into the FBI, the Justice Department, because they want to serve their country. Who, who's going to want to do it if what you do is you get, you get publicly branded as part of the deep state, you get accused of being a traitor, and you face a criminal investigation, which costs a ruinous amount of money just to defend yourself against. That's why I think it is so worrisome about the broader future impact on our democratic institutions when you have behavior like this. And in many ways, that it is the point of that behavior when you listen to, to what Trump has said and what, what Steve Bannon said early on, the destruction of, of the deep state, the killing of that morale, not wanting anyone to work for these organizations was exactly their point. Well, yes, and to me, the irony of this and something that Trump never seems to understand is that these people, in many ways, are here to protect him. You know, when Comey went and told him about the existence of the Russia investigation and this dossier, he was doing that to protect Trump so that Trump understood that, you know, he he wouldn't be in a position to be blackmailed by the Russians over this, that when People stop him from his worst impulses, as Don McGahn, the, you know, the White House counsel, right. did repeatedly. He's not crossing Trump. He's not thwarting Trump. He is protecting Trump. The problem for Trump now is he's gotten rid of all of these people to the extent that he can. And he doesn't have people now willing to stand up to him. And he is in bigger trouble now than ever. If he still had some of those people around him, maybe he wouldn't have acted on that impulse on the phone call to Ukraine. Maybe he wouldn't have acted on impulse in that phone call to the president of Turkey. You know, Trump is his own worst enemy here. And that really goes back to the beginning, because as you point out, at at the start of the Russia investigation, Trump wasn't the target. No, and he probably never would have been, because in the end, they did not find the overt conspiratorial acts on Trump's part in collusion with the Russians. It was only after he, again, acting largely on impulse, he decides he's going to fire Comey. He comes into the White House the next day. He says to McGahn and others, he says, I know you told me, you know, I've I've made up my mind and don't try to talk me out of it. In other words, he's not going to listen to them. Um, He then gets rid of the people who tried to restrain him. He lies about it then. He acts like, and you know, everyone at the FBI and the Justice Department is terrified that he's about to shut down the whole investigation. They're, you know, scurrying to secure the evidence. I think a lot of people don't realize Rosenstein at the Justice Department, McCabe at the FBI, they went to Capitol Hill. They met with this so-called gang of eight top Democratic and Republican officials there. 
Paul Ryan, the then Speaker of the House, is sitting there. They say, we're going to open a file on the president of the U.S., Trump, and here are the reasons why. And reason number one is his firing of Comey, and reason number two is his lying about it. Nobody objected. The Republicans did not object. Everybody understood why they had to do it, and, and they approved of it. This wasn't something done by, you know, a sinister cabal in the dark cloak of darkness. It was done through the democratic processes. And it was only because of those acts by Trump that he became the subject. He has no one to blame but himself. How do we explain Bill Barr in this mix? Well, you see in, in Deep State, I mean, the minute there's, you know, blood in the water with Sessions, Barr is scurrying to, right. you know, you know, get favor with Trump. He writes this, you know unsolicited memo in which he gives a, you know, unbelievably pro-Trump view of the powers of the presidency. And then lo and behold, he gets named to attorney general, a job he was obviously campaigning for. And once in office, he certainly delivers for Trump. I mean, he wastes no time in exonerating him over the Mueller report. He misstates what's in the Mueller report so much so that the tight-lipped Mueller himself wrote a letter saying that he was misstating it. Um, and then here's the most shocking thing to me. The whistleblower has, has come forward now. He, the complaint goes to, to Barr. The appropriate thing would be for Barr to hand this over to the FBI, say, investigate this, bring me the facts, and then I will make a decision about whether a law was broken or not. No. Without any investigation whatsoever, he said, oh, there's no crime here, so there's nothing to investigate. So the FBI is not investigating it. That is ex exactly the danger of a politicized Justice Department. I mean, fortunately, we do have Congress in its own investigative arm. Uh, you know, I think they have no choice but to launch an investigation of this, because otherwise the American people will never know what happened. As a contrast to this, you talk about Hillary Clinton and, and when she was under investigation for, for Benghazi and for the emails. And, and a very different approach to handling something like that, letting the process play out if you feel you're innocent and, and, and feeling that you'll be exonerated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hillary Clinton, what, say what else you might about her, but she behaved in a way that typically innocent people and people who are confident of their innocence and who believe in the system do. I mean, obviously she had lawyers. She is entitled to invoke whatever, you know, due process protections are afforded her. But she essentially, she did cooperate with the investigation. She didn't go out publicly and call it a witch hunt or attack people who were accusing her. And by the way, contrast that you know, uh, with the way Bill Clinton handled the Monica Lewinsky case. They attacked uh, Ken Starr. They demonized Ken Starr. I mean, this is like the beginning of the kind of the whole playbook where, you know, confronted with evidence that you don't like or you think is very incriminating, you turn the tables and you try to go after the, the prosecutor or someone who's investigating you. Well, Hillary Clinton, to her credit, didn't do that. Trump is doing it in spades. He's gone way beyond, you know, what was done in the the Ken Starr thing, and, you know, is saying essentially that the people now pursuing him or daring to investigate him deserve the death penalty. Um, honestly, I never thought I, in my lifetime I would see a Republican president demonizing the law enforcement agencies of the federal government. One of the other ironies that, that you point out is that he had friends in, in law enforcement early on, that in fact one of the reasons Comey felt it was so necessary to come out with, with the report about the reinvestigation of the emails after the case was closed is that he felt that they were Trump supporters that would leak that, so he had no choice but to go public. Absolutely, and I, and I can understand his decision there. And there was a hard core of anti-Clinton people, some of them in the, the New York Bureau, which is where the laptop surfaced, but elsewhere in the FBI as well, who, you know, expressed highly partisan and hostile views towards Hillary Clinton. Now, they were not working on the Hillary Clinton investigation exactly, but they were certainly in a position, as you point out, with a well-placed leak to have um, created quite a political explosion that would have been much worse for her than, than Comey coming forward. And I think this is a, an important point for for people to bear in mind, you know, the the Peter um, Strzok, Lisa Page mm -hmm. text became a huge issue in this whole thing when it was revealed that out of the you know tens of thousands of texts, there were some that were 
inappropriately and quite hostile towards uh, Trump. But no one looked at the text of anyone to see, oh, were there any texts that were hostile to Hillary Clinton? I, be- I would bet anything that there were plenty of communications that were hostile to Hillary Clinton. And by the way, there's no litmus test for working in, in the FBI. You're entitled to your political views. If you want to be anti-Hillary Clinton, that's fine. If you want to be anti-Trump, fine, pro-Trump, whatever. Like every other citizen, you're going to have views and you're entitled to those. But you can't let them influence their official duties. And over and over again in Deep State, I really document how not only were Lisa Page and Peter Strzok fair to Trump and Hillary Clinton, but in many ways they were harder on Clinton than they were on Trump. And if you look objectively at what happened in that election, the idea that the FBI was favoring Clinton over Trump is preposterous. There are many people in this country that still blame the FBI and Comey for Trump's victory. And if they had wanted to derail Trump, they're sitting on the most salacious allegations ever made against a candidate for a president, and they didn't, they never leaked any of that. They never made an announcement about it. People went to the polls never knowing about it. And if they wanted to stop Trump, they had all the ammunition they needed. Why hasn't Comey made that point more forcefully when he is constantly criticized for being responsible for the outcome of the election? You, you know, I think Comey has made the point. You know, it's it's tougher, I think, for him because he is the subject of the criticism. So it seems kind of self-serving. I think something that I'm able to do is I could come in from the outside. And by the way, I have no ax to grind here. I know, you know, I'm not friends with any of these people. And, you know, I try to be an objective, nonpartisan reporter. But I can just look at the facts and say, you know, here's what people were thinking. Here's what they were doing. Here they were reacting to it. And you can disagree with what the decision was they made, but you can at least understand why they did it and what their what their goals were. And I think it, when you see that on Comey's part, it's very hard to criticize him for the decision he made. Well, finally, what do you see as the link between all of this, everything that went on with the Russia investigation, all of these players that we've been talking about, and where we are now with with Ukraine and impeachment and, and, and really what this history that you write about in Deep State tells us about what we're about to see play out over the next few months? Well, honestly, I think it, it tells you everything we need to know, and it, it made these events so predictable. I mean, I, I'm not sure I would have predicted what happened with, in the speed with which is, I mean, literally the day after Mueller testified, Trump is on the phone uh, with the Ukraine president. Um, but the quality, I mean, again, if I was drafting articles of impeachment, I would include the instruction, obstruction elements that I cover in deep state that Mueller goes over to some extent, um, because it shows this very significant pattern where First of all, Trump is impulsive. He acts on, as he puts it, on his gut feelings. He doesn't listen to his advisors. People who disagree with him, who dare to thwart him, he gets rid of them. And then he lies about it, which looks like a cover-up, or he covers up. This is exactly what happened uh, in the, um, the whole Russia probe. It's exactly what's happening in the Ukraine, and it's exactly what's happening with Syria. Now, anybody who dares to challenge him is part of this sinister deep state. But at this point, how many deep states are there, really? I mean, everybody in the FBI is in the deep state. The Justice Department is in the deep state. Now, with Ukraine, the State Department is part of the deep state. And with Syria, is the military going to be part of the deep state? Honestly, I think he's, he's cried wolf here maybe one or two times too many. This is a very, very clear pattern, and I hope the House, when they – put together their summary of these things show that we're not just talking about one phone call to Ukraine here. This is a very consistent pattern on someone who does not recognize the existence of the rule of law, and certainly to the extent he does, will not honor it. James B. Stewart, the book is Deep State, Trump, the FBI, and the Rule of Law. James, it's always a pleasure. I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank you.